Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning, Michelle. Here we are again for our health talks. I'm Ellen Crowley, and I'm here from the Valley Regional Hospital Foundation. And with me is Michelle McIsaac from Clinad Counseling. And as you know, if you've been joining us, we are having a great conversation about what happens to us and our, our uh, feelings and thoughts during COVID. We've explored a couple of topics as part of our Mind Matters series. And today we wanted to talk about couples. So we know that couples operate differently and there are all kinds of different types of couples, right, Michelle? But I've been reflecting the last two weeks about what it means to be a couple during quarantine because my partner is not here. I am quarantining with my adult children and so he is off site which has been a blessing because he's been our runner, but it's also given me an opportunity to think about how it would feel to be in complete lockdown with him, as well as adult children, a baby and four dogs. And I think it might be a little tense. It might really test all of my skills. So for those of us who may be feeling a little strained right now, Michelle, help. <laughs> what should we do? <laughs> great, great segue into our conversation today, Ellen. I'm uh, I'm looking forward to this. I do uh, a lot of couple work and thoroughly enjoy the dynamics that play out in our relationships with our partners. And uh, I think COVID has well, and there's been lots of uh, media attention too around the the impact of of the extra stress on relationships. And there's been uh, some research that has sort of let us know that there are. Um, there are couples that are that are splitting or couples who are really struggling and, and looking for couple support. And I think, you know, there, as you just said, the dynamics like, you know, two adult kids, a husband, four dogs, like that's overwhelming and a baby, I forgot the baby, you know, those kinds of circumstances are overwhelming. I think there are lots of families where, you know, there were lots of people on board. The, so the extra people in the house would be a stress load. The other thing would be, that when we are stressed, as we talked about before, we can end up in different places in our nervous system. So some of us have heard about stress responses like fight, flight, freeze. So fight, you know, we get really angry. Flight, we move away from whatever it is that's stressing us out and freeze mm -hmm. sort of that uh, low state, sometimes hopeless, helpless kinds of feelings, but we're in a state of paralysis. We might find it hard to get motivated to do things. And when we're in those states, we're more likely to default to our old fashioned, our old go to standby coping strategies, which, you know, for some people means eating more or drinking more or shutting down and not really being able to keep up with the demands of day to day. Um, there have also been multiple stressors on families where there might be dual uh, working parents and they're trying to navigate homeschooling with with work ex expectations and so there are a multitude of extra layers of stress load that if if we haven't figured out really great ways to deal with stress with our in conjunction with our partner or if we struggle to express what we need then all of a sudden there's this disconnect this disharmonious kind of interaction that happens in relationships, period, whether it's parent-child or partner-to-partner -partner or between friends or external family. And so relationships in general, I think, have been tested with the extra stress load of the last year and a bit. Mm. I know I have certainly heard anecdotally that some couples really have seriously really struggled through the last year, year and a half. And I'm sure you know, there's a lot of compounded variables. There's work stress, money stress, and as you say, people trying to maybe work from home or maybe not having work, the children, et cetera. But if you have a relationship where you don't maybe communicate very well, and now all of a sudden you're together, um, it's probably not the time to start doing that deep work. So how, what, how would we swim through the the troubled waters, if you will, uh, coming out intact and then kind of moving forward. What would that strategy look like? Do you, you know what I mean? Like, so you can't do the deep dive when you're in the without help, probably 
when you're in the midst of that? Mm -hmm. I think the first piece is recognizing that no kidding, you're struggling. It, you know, I think first and foremost, we need to name the fact that this has been an unprecedented load on families, period. Whether you're a single parent, you're a grandparent parenting, you're a whatever. I mean, there's a million and one variations, even, you know, a, a partner's away, maybe they're military, or maybe they work at a province, or, you know, there's been uh, dealing with all kinds of layers. And so, all that to say the the best place to begin is to recognize it's okay that there's an issue and that it doesn't necessarily mean your relationship is beyond a point of repair what it might mean is that we need to learn some new skills on how to navigate complex conversations and intense emotions the, the, you know even if we just think about what it's like to care for a partner with mental health issues, knowing that COVID has exacerbated or, or made worse some of those mental health issues for people, sometimes just educating ourselves about what our partners might be going through. So what does depression look like in the couple dynamic? And it might look like that you know, partners not able to get off the couch, or they might be struggling to even go out and try to find work right now. They might be uh, really low, they might be drinking more. What do these things mean for us? And can I understand that as a partner? So if there's one partner who's able to be well enough to, to look for information, there are there are things that can sort of support us in, re in recognizing and understanding mental health and how it plays out. The other big, about... sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say just, you know, in the normal dynamics of relationships, maybe it's not a deeply troubled relationship, but it's just a normal relationship that's being pushed, if you will. Um, you've talked a lot about permission in the past. Um, I'm thinking about strategies and being able to say, I need this now. So for example, again, if I use myself, I need to be, I need space sometimes. And I think we all do. And I know that when we've been through this COVID period, there have been times when I just simply want to go out for my power walk by myself and to be able to say to my partner who says, would you like me to go for a walk with you? For me to say, and I have, not today. I need to go by myself. And that's okay. That's the piece I think that people you know, kind of struggle with. It's okay to say, no, you know what? I really need this time myself. Yeah, and I think there are people who absolutely need that time of separation and their partner may or may not actually have the same need. And so there might be conflict invariably by asking for what mm -hmm. you need. And it, it often leads people to this place where it's hard to ask for that. And there's a couple of reasons why it's hard to ask. If we ask and we're gonna bump up against our partners, coping strategy, right? So if my coping strategy is I need time alone, but when my partner gets upset, they need us, then all of a sudden right. the dynamic here we might not understand. Right. So, so recognizing that can play out is huge, right? That that can play out, but sometimes it leads us to not asking for what we need, which invariably translates to resentment, which I think is probably one of the bigger uh, ripples that have been happening to couples over this pandemic because there isn't a, a you know the the normal balance and flow of day-to-day -day activities has been completely upended and so some partners might be caring more than their other partner and there could be a multitude of reasons for that the other thing is sometimes we don't know what we need and I think, Ellen, you know, some of us have done maybe some of our own work along the way, or we've just learned over time and years that we, there are things we need. I know I need a lot of time. And, and sometimes it's hard to actually give myself permission to do that. I also know there are some things that I haven't really had in my repertoire this year, and I've had to add because my own coping strategies have been limited in terms mm -hmm. of their impact. And so for me, that translated into maybe not working five full days a week or staggering my schedules or doing things in a different kind of way. How that benefits the couple dynamic is that as we explore to figure out what we enjoy or what feels good, we can involve our partners in that to have a little bit of a light moment. But if we're both activated and in high states of our nervous system, it's going to be really challenging to feel close, 
to feel close, we need to be able to find that rest state, that green zone, mm. that place you get to when you're out for a walk with your puppy, right? There's a, there's right. a, <sighs> that comes. That's where we find connection. And sometimes couples will come and they'll, they'll think I'm having issues with communication. When a big piece of that is, I don't know how to ask for what I need. Right. I don't even know what I need. And I'm, I'm seeing the stress in my partner and feeling this disconnect without really a path to be able to know how to get to that place of connection. So it's, it's one about giving yourself permission 100% about recognizing you're not alone. There are all kinds of couples and families all over the place that are struggling as well with separation and grief and loss and all those pieces. And it's also to recognize where we are in our nervous system as well as our partners and know that that's not a forever state. There is a way back to well being and with support. And for some, that may mean professional support. Um, we can, we can find our rhythm again, we can find our ebb and flow and our give and take. And it may be the stress load we're bearing that's impacting that capacity to communicate or connect. Right. So Michelle, in the la last few minutes that we have, you know, I always like to end with a few positive strategies that we might use. So one of the things I heard definitely, and it's been a common theme, is self-care. So self-care, but maybe you could just walk us through again, some of your strategies. I know we're going to hear some of the same things because what it permeates it, or it goes through everything that we've talked about in the past, but maybe you, we could end up with some positive strategies and support maybe that we could offer people who may be listening or, um, or maybe couples might even be listening together. So what would you recommend? I have a couple of fun ones that I give couples for homework and homework is never about, you know, you must comply. Homework is about let's be playful. Let's to, to get into that place of lighter connectedness. We need to be able to tap into playfulness a little bit. So silliness is actually really beneficial for couples. Get silly, do something silly, you know, face paint one another or something random, go for a walk, get out in the woods, plan a picnic if you've got a little bit of energy to do that. And that could just be picking up some way on the way to the shore. Um, the having a ritual every day where you're trying to connect with your partner, which could just be sitting for 10 minutes on the sofa, sharing an iced tea, or, you know, having a, having a time when you've committed each day for five or 10 minutes to just maybe sit close to one another and have that proximity where in doing that, we are actually having an opportunity for co-regulation where we are mm -hmm. each other's nervous system in this relationship. Um, another one I, I often recommend, and particularly if you're both finding yourself uber stressed, it's called the shut up and hug, which is not overly PC, <laughs> but it's funny enough to kind of keep in the front forefront of your mind. When you find yourself fighting over something as silly as socks on the floor or what's going to happen for supper or who's bathing the kid that night, just stop recognize your both and your activation level of your nervous system you're in fight or flight mode and just hug and what we mm. do when we have that physical contact science tells us it actually reduces pain and discomfort in the body when we are being held either by hand or as a hug from someone who's significant to us so mm. those would be my pieces what Makes about a pillow friend. fight do we have a pillow fight <laughs> I, I, when you, when you, I had, I just had this vision in my head of, you know, when, as kids, if you think about it, and sometimes I think we need to be kids, right? And you can think about being with kids, one of your siblings or whatever, and having those moments of you just wanted to knock each other out, but the pillow fight, and it's just that great relief and, and usually hilarity. It is. And you know what? Squirt guns also work really well. <laughs> Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. Or water There's balloons. Nice... Fill a bucket <laughs> and meet your partner when they get home at the end of the day. Absolutely, it's 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 in play. It's in those silly free moments. If we can get there, that we actually feel connected, and those mm. moments are so precious. And they would be even if someone were coming in professionally. Those are some of the lighter places we would begin, so that we could practice getting into that green zone together. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for this. And I think we're going to close now. I'm going to take the opportunity to thank everyone for joining us and to invite you to uh, share your time with us on our Facebook or on webs our website, Valley Regional Hospital Foundation and Clonad. And we're going to share a slide with you at the end of this. We really welcome your feedback and your input around our, our series. And we uh, also offer up to you that there are very good resources out there and you can find them on the Clonad website. Um, Michelle, I don't know what we're going to talk about next time, but stay tuned, folks. We'll be back in two weeks with something. Maybe we'll move away from COVID for, for a bit and talk about, I don't know. I'm looking for some ideas. Talk to me, people. And, uh, and we look forward to hearing them. So bye for now and uh, take care, everybody. Thanks, Ellen. Bye.